fat cells are only about the size of a period on the end of a sentence when they're healthy. But when they become bloated like this, um, then they're sending out all these inflammatory molecules. And you can imagine we have 100 billion of them, what that kind of effect that can have if you're, say, obese. And um, this really uh, is inflammatory in many, many ways. And of course, we have to be careful of the sugar intake. Dr. Lori Shemek, really an honor to have you on the HVMN program. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. One of the biggest concepts and the focus areas of our podcast is talking about health span, longevity, human optimization, uh, getting the most out of our short times on this planet. And one of the concepts that keeps popping up in a lot of our conversations is this notion of inflammation. And right. I know that one of your focus areas is really drilling down into the mechanisms and the good and potentially the bad of, of inflammation in our lives. So uh, maybe we start there. Um, on one hand, give you a background on how you came to look at inflammation as a key interest area. And then two, perhaps defining broadly, uh, what is inflammation? I mean, let's just help define from the very, very fundamentals here. I was interested in low-grade inflammation long before it ever became a buzzword. And I know that uh, many people know or have heard of inflammation now, but when I first started talking about it, it was they were just, you know, what? Inflammation? You mean that causes heart disease? <laughs> and so it was, you know, it took me a long time to get to uh, now. So my experience with low level inflammation is what I call it. Um, it started when I was a young girl and I saw my mother suffer from a constant stream of chronic health conditions. And so, um, you know, it was just, it was really sad because I was a young girl. She was a single mother with three young children and my mother could have made different choices, right? The, the inflammation, we could have prevented that, but she didn't know I didn't know. And so um, she died, unfortunately, at the very young age of 36, leaving behind three young children with nowhere to go. And so that set me on the path of, of uh, what I do now, helping people make different choices in their life. And so I was really interested in um, the core cause of what promotes these and exacerbates these diseases and conditions. And so I um, did a deep dive into the research and uh, wrote a couple books and, uh, you know, and so here I am today talking about it. But suffice it to say that we absolutely need inflammation. We need inflammation and it's called acute inflammation. And, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever uh, we hurt ourselves or say, for example, we cut our finger. So when we cut our finger, uh, an enormous amount of inflammatory molecules are released and soldiers, if you will, rush to the site to repair the wound. The wound heals, the soldiers go away and all is well, right? Yep. But there's another type of inflammation that is in with acute inflammation. I like to call it loud inflammation because you darn well know it's there. It hurts. It's tender to the touch. It's sore. You know it's there. It's like there's some swelling, a little bit of redness for folks right. that just you know when you when you cut yourself, there's that little red kind of yeah. pus that comes out, and that's mm -hmm. your inflammation, your in, in your immune cells going in and attacking all the bad guys and and starting the repair process, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you know you sprain your ankle, the black and blue, you skin your knee, and all that. Okay, so that's a good thing. We need it to stay alive. Otherwise, we're just sitting ducks we wouldn't be here so it's an immune response and that's very important to remember and so uh, the next type of inflammation is called silent or chronic inflammation some people call it low-grade inflammation some people like me call it low-level inflammation but whatever you call it it's like having a sore on the inside of your body that never heals okay so um, it's similar to a glowing ember that you know, just is kind of there just waiting for that fuel. Okay. It just never goes away. And then one day 
ignites into a full-blown fire. So that uh, silent inflammation is really catastrophic in terms of health because it is the core cause, underlying cause of most illness, disease, faster aging, and even weight gain. And many people don't know that. And so when we have this in this uh, this low level inflammatory attack, um, we we manifest certain conditions such as heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, rheumatoid arthritis. You just name it; the list goes on. Right. And um, many people don't realize it. And so, the number one lifestyle choice that one can make is to live an anti-inflammatory life. Okay make anti-inflammatory lifestyle choices. And that's what my mother didn't do. And, and, you know, it's, there's so many people that do not realize that, that are gobbling down the white sugar and the poor food choices are creating responses in the body that are having this inflammatory effect. And, you know, I always wish we had some sort of alarm that went off in our body, <laughs> you know, even though we can't feel the inflammation at that point, one day down the road, you know, we will. Let's absolutely talk about diet and nutrition. And I know that there's certain celebrity diets like Tom Brady's diet that talk about lowering inflammatory, uh, triggering foods. But mm -hmm. before talking about that, let's talk about some of the signs as you're saying uh, uh, around inflammation. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of our nerdier listeners really mm -hmm. like talking about the biomarkers, things like interleukin six or cytokines or the, the things that one could measure to detect some of these things or C reactive protein is another popular, uh, inflammatory marker. Uh, as you work with your clients, as you do your research, um, what are the biomarker signs that, that you look for as you're assessing acute versus chronic inflammation or low-level inflammation? Well, I always like my clients to have a um, C-reactive protein test, CPR test, because that's a very accurate test. Okay. And if, you know, they, it, you, it doesn't tell you where the inflammation is but it does tell you that you have inflammation somewhere. And that means you can, one, you can go on a hunt for it and figure out where it's coming from. And two, you can start reducing it. Yeah. And uh, so it's really important to get that number. Um, we, we like to see a really low number and um, it, most people are walking around, unfortunately, with a high number. And uh, so that's one test that I think is very, very important to get. If people come to me and they're complaining of brain fog or fatigue or uh, anxiety, for example, pain in their body somewhere, um, they have digestive flare-ups, these are all signs of low-level inflammation. Unfortunately, though, many people don't exhibit or feel anything at all, and they can have inflammation in the body, which is why I always say it's very important to get tested, and it's also very important to take a proactive anti-inflammatory stance yeah. in your life. And, you know, we have, uh, you know, when, you're, when you have um, a, a problem with uh, low level inflammation, you are creating all sorts of problems in the body. And in, from a cellular perspective, you have uh, something called NF kappa B, for example, that is really uh, inflammatory. Okay. So you have uh, this signaling pathway actually reaches into the nucleus of the cell changing the DNA and promoting cytokines throughout the body. And this is setting the whole body up, not just locally, but the whole body up for inflammation. And so this is a very important signaling pathway. It does, there is some balance to it, but suffice it to say that we want to keep that as low as possible because the more uh, it's elicited or the, the NF kappa B alarm system goes off, um, the faster we age and the more chronic disease we're, so that we succumb to. That, that makes a lot of sense. One thing that as you're talking about the primal cause of inflammation, what that reminds me of is what a lot of our guests talk about, which is insulin resistance as also a, a parallel, very primal cause for a lot of these end conditions. And I 
presume, assume that there's a lot of interrelationship between inflammation and higher inflammatory diets and also diets that trigger high insulin response and builds up insulin resistance. Curious uh, to get your thoughts on the potential interplay between inflammation and insulin, uh, which also, you know, relates a lot to low carbohydrate or ketogenic diets as a way to potentially manage both of those types of responses. Um, curious to get your thoughts uh, on, on these kind of two primal causes. Right. That's a great question because they both are directly, you know, part of the inflammatory response. So, you know, within our cells, we have, we, uh, let's just say our NF kappa B is, is the alarm goes off for that. Uh, then we have something called, uh, the cell danger response or CDR that is, uh, that the mitochondria are, you know, back to the old, uh, ancient mitochondria, but the mitochondria are really sensing organelles. Okay. So when there is, um, when they sense danger or they, they get the signal that danger is about, that's going to hurt the cell itself or the host, you, um, then, then it stops ATP production immediately within the cell, okay? Mm. And ATP is the energy that our cells utilize in order to, for us to stay alive. And um, so when that uh, energy stops, creation stops, it is then made on the outside of the cell. It's created by the mitochondria on the outside of the cell, which in turn then strengthens the cell wall. Okay. It firms it up, making it, making it imp impenetrable to say viruses or bacteria or any other invader. Mm. And so that's really an important component to, you know, a primal, preventative uh, way of overcoming inflammation in the body. And so once that occurs, then the, the body can then heal, you know, antioxidants then have the ability to heal and repair. So the regeneration can occur. And, uh, but the issue is, is, is cell danger response or CDR turned off. And in most cases, in many cases, rather, especially with people with chronic diseases and illnesses, weight gain, uh, it stays on. And the only way it ever gets turned off is if the brain says, OK, enough, you know, it's time to to turn it off. It, t it tells the mitochondria, essentially, that uh, you can go back in the cell and start making ATP within the cell again. Hmm. And uh, this is you know, really important because a lot of people are walking around with this, uh, CDR and they have no idea. So what this, what happens is as a byproduct, um, we have insulin resistance, we have, um, type two diabetes, we have weight gain and, uh, obesity is people who are obese are walking around with CDR. Fascinating. So the CDR response, this is a new concept to me, triggers the mitochondria to leave the cell. Yes. And, yeah. and, and, and they start producing ATP outside the mm -hmm. cell. So there's like a free floating organelle outside the, the, right. the, the cell membrane. And it's, uh, they fortify the cell wall. And as I'm sure you and your listeners are aware, the cell wall is where all the magic happens, right? Pretty much. And so um, that becomes... Not much is going on. So any we've all experienced uh, cell danger response in when we've had the flu, you know, how tired and fatigued we feel that is um, or a, a really bad cold that that those are examples of CDR. But then the brain says, OK, you're, you're OK now. You're healing. Um, the inflammation's going away and we're good to go. And then and the mitochondria migrate back in within the cell right. membrane. Huh, interesting. I'd never heard of that concept before. I guess that could make sense in the sense that if the, if the mitochondria are exiting the cells, then you have less ATP production and then less ATP is less energetic, which could explain some of the brain fog or, or the tiredness and weakness from being, being sick or having a large, large in, in inflammatory response. Right, like chronic fatigue syndrome or, yeah. you know, you think about, um, 
the importance of our mitochondria, right? People underestimate those little things because um, they're just so tiny and they're, you know, they're just, we've, we've all known from biology, right? They're, they've just always been there, yeah. but they are crucial to keeping us uh, healthy and lean. Okay. If we keep them happy, we're happy. The better off our mitochondria are the, the more of everything that we can do. So again, they produce energy in the body, cellular energy. And when we have that energy, everything's working right. Our cells are working well, and uh, the inflammation is is be- there's a balance there. Absolutely, and I think that's a lot of where the interest is from our listeners around how do you create more mitochondria, mitogenesis, and and you know there's good data around types of different types of exercises, strength training, aerobic training, uh, different types of diets. You get on more of a ketogenic being a ketosis triggers mitogenesis. So um, absolutely uh, agree with you in terms of mitochondrial health. I think is becoming a growing interest area within both the, I think the scientific research community as well as practitioners and people trying to apply it to their everyday life. Um, so moving into pr- more practical tips or ideas given the baseline understanding um how do we then control inflammation how do we create a lifestyle whether that's through food or different types of exercise or other environmental factors should we be thinking about to reduce this low level inflammation that you talk about one thing that we want to do is i'm sure your listeners are aware of is we want to uh, activate nrf2 right and okay. nrf2 and that's a pathway that tamps down on inflammation and so there are many healthy lifestyle choices that we can take to, in order to do that. And, um, you know, I talk about a lot about getting quality sleep is really important to activate this, this signaling pathway. And um, we want to, you know, remove gluten from our diet. Um, there are those of us that can eat gluten. And I had the 23andMe test and it showed I was gluten, I was at, at risk for celiac, but, you know, thank goodness I'm not. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's something that activates, um, you know, something like nf kappa B. So um, you want to exercise. You, you definitely want to get some hit in there because that um, research has shown increases um, <clears throat> not only mitochondrial growth, um, and not, you know, number and, uh, the health of the mitochondria, but it also increases telomere length and really important component to optimizing health. So, um, telomere length, they have shown now there's a few studies that show telomere length is, um, uh, can be a problem, you know, depending on, um, you know, they, depending on, uh, is it too long? Are their telomeres too long? Or, you know, is it part of a cancer or something that you don't want uncontrolled yeah, growth? Telomerase is too, right. there's too much telomerase. So they're really, uh, you know, there's a lot of research showing that, that, uh, the longer your telomeres though, the better off you are. And the more, it's a more of a genetic, really uh, biomarker of age, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, health and people with the longest telomeres are the leanest, longest living, healthiest people out there. So, you know, what can we say? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's a really good, uh, that's important. So, um, that NRF2, um, is also, we need nutrients. We need supplements that are going to, uh, boost this pathway. And, um, there's something called epigenetics. I'm sure your listeners are aware of, and that is, uh, where we, we used to believe that our science, that our genes were just set somewhere in a glass case. And that was it. You know, if your family had heart disease too bad, girl, you know, you're going to get it. And, cancer, et cetera, et cetera, right? And obesity. But we now know that with through epigenetics that the choices that we make, we have 80 to 90% uh, control in the outcome of our health. And so if we're choosing negative or uh, not hel- not healthful food choices, then we're going to get lousy gene expression, okay? And it, we do have genetic 
vul- you know, pre- we are predisposed to certain genetic conditions, but we do have the awesome choice of not going there in most cases. Right. Right. The environmental fit factors really drive the expression of different genes, which I think is uh, an exciting area of research, right? I think now it, you can manipulate what proteins are expressed versus what is not through different lifestyle choices th- like nutrition. So perhaps just like fo- let's, let's focus on nutrition as a starting point. Um, I think probably in the media, people have heard of about low inflammatory diets. Um, any sense to that? Uh, what would you say are highly inflammatory foods versus low inflammatory foods? I mentioned that I think Tom Brady's diet talks a lot about not eating nightshades, and I think he talks about not eating gluten. Um, what's real? What's kind of hyped up? What's kind of BS? Um, uh, can, can we disambiguate and, and clarify some of the myths out there on inflama- inflammatory foods? We are all genetically unique. Okay. okay. So what is, you, you know, there's a study out of the Wiseman or I forgot out of Israel. I can't remember. Yeah, exactly. I think the cell metabolism paper, right? The people have different glycemic responses to the same food. Right. So some half the people could eat white rice, blood sugar went through the roof. Uh, the other half could eat white, white rice and flat. Okay, yep. nothing happened. And so that's a, a strong indication of how, where we all are. And you look at, you know, uh, that my test, my genetic testing puts me at r- major risk for super obesity. <laughs> okay. But uh, my mother's side of the family, they're all obese. Um, but because of my lifestyle choices, I uh, am not obese. Okay. So uh, we do, that's an epigenetic choice right there. But the foods that we eat, I would say nice shades are inflammatory if you have a condition. So, for example, um, eggplant or tomatoes, for example, um, exacerbate arthritis. And, you know, we know that, um, you know, it's they're very good for us. They're very healthy unless you're on the ketogenic diet, you know, but, um, if you're intermittent fasting, that's a whole different story. But again, you, I always have people be their own case researcher. Okay. Their own study, uh, because it's really difficult for people to know exactly how food's going to react with them. So, um, you, but you do have to generalize. Okay. So in my books, I've generalized anti-inflammatory foods are absolutely critical in my opinion. And uh, so when you eat, you know, mushrooms, for example, uh, reishi mushroom, any type of mushroom, even white button mushrooms will reduce inflammation. They have a marked, powerful cellular benefit. Is there a component in mushrooms that triggers that pathway? The polysaccharides in there are really, really beneficial for people. Um, okay. They, you know, every single type of mushroom has a different effect. I'm sure you know. Some are magic mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, not, you you know, the, uh, not the other kind of mushrooms. Yeah. But <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you know, we have blueberries are excellent choices. Um, You have uh, spices like turmeric, you have, you know, cold water fish, the omega-3 fat in cold water fish is is excellent. Uh, Protein in and of itself is anti-inflammatory. So we want to keep our blood sugar as low as possible, want to keep our insulin tamp down as much as possible. And the, in most cases, the uh, anti-inflammatory diet will do that, assuming you're not adding in grains. So in terms of macros, it's essentially, it, it sounds similar to a low carbohydrate diet. And when you're working with clients or as you're, then you're, you know, looking at, you know, what your protocol is, are you trying to target ketosis or are you just trying to reduce carbohydrate intake? I mean, essentially how, how important is being in ketosis? in terms of managing inflammation? It's a benefit at some point. Okay. You know, um, but I always want people to get out of ketosis as well. I I love the refeeding method, um, but the carb reloading, if you will. But, um, you know, 
my what I have my clients do and what I personally do is I eat a very low carb diet and go into ketosis probably every day, you know. Um, but essentially overall I eat a low carb diet. Do you intermittent fast? Or mm-hmm. do you have a fasting I do window? Okay. Fasting, yeah. Okay. I do for 14 hours. I don't like to go more than 16 hours as being a woman, because a woman, you know, we're so finely tuned hormonally that yeah. it just can tr- set us off. So um, we don't want that. <laughs> so we want, we definitely want um, a very low carb diet. We want at other times a higher carb diet. And so I, um, you know, will recommend people have, you know, if they're wanting more carbs in their diet, sweet potatoes, you know, even I will recommend brown rice, anything that, you know, they like that's adding in more carbs, as long as it's not inflammatory for them. So uh, I think a discussion on food at this point about sugar would be, you know, it would be remiss for me not to touch on sugar because oh, let's actually talk about sugar. Yeah. I mean, the good foods, we all know what those are, yeah. but um, I'll go over some of those. But after you know, it's funny because a lot of people, they know that sugar's uh, the bad guy, right? But they don't know exactly why. Hey, listeners, if you're enjoying this episode thus far, please consider writing a review on our iTunes page. It really does help increase the visibility of our podcast. That's really the best way to support our work. In appreciation for your review, we'll hook you up with $15 of HVMN store credit. We also love it when we see you guys share our episodes that you've enjoyed on your Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we often reshare those posts. Just tag us at our handle at HVMN. Now back to the show. I always like to let people know that sugar is is on a cellular level um, dangerous to our bodies. And there's the thought that if you're an athlete and you eat sugar, that you're metabolizing it very fast. And that's true. Um, And so, but, but outside of that, I say avoid sugar. I never say moderate sugar or just a little bit. I just say, avoid it. Okay. Keep it out of your, out of your life. And, um, and that's because there's a glycolytic effect on within the cell and throughout the body. So there's something called glycation that Mm. occurs, um, when sugar molecules meet protein molecules, they have this interaction where they bind together and it essentially caramelizes the tissue. Okay. It's, um, it's called the browning effect really. And it promotes something called, uh, the it ages, A G E S and advanced glycation and products, I believe. Right. Right. Yes. And ages is part of, uh, for example, NF Kappa B turned on immediately the minute you take in sugar because the body, the cells, they, they don't know what to do with sugar so much. You know, if you're lacking sugar, you're, you're good, you're good to go, but most of us are not. And, um, so what, when that happens, a lot of people don't know that it changes the nature and the structure of the protein within the body. And that includes your organs as well, your eyes, you know, your skin, it, it changes the nature of the skin, you know, it causes wrinkling wrinkles and sagging skin, but it also affects the is inside of a cell the nucleus of a cell. So there's a glycation effect going on inside the cell as well. And that's what we don't want. Okay. So my, my feeling is that the, the um, more you take care of your cell, the, the more cell health you have, the healthier and leaner you will be. That's something that I've been looking at a lot as well. The notion of these advanced glycation and products, these ages. And I think one of the leading theories in the low carb ketogenic nutrition world is that, you know, the standard of care is essentially saying that a lot of cholesterol, or a lot of fat are things that build up atherosclerosis and lead down to cardiovascular risk. But it's actually the inf- inflammation called, caused by things like ages that right. are actually the primal cause 
that inflame the blood vessels where the fat then goes in and starts, uh, the cholesterol goes in and starts building up these plaques. I think it's a particular interesting area because I think when people talk about cardiovascular health with keto and cholesterol, I think they miss that, that, that glucose story, that, that sugar story. And it doesn't do anybody any good if they're eating, um, you know, if they're, say they're getting their carbs, they're intermittent fasting right. and they're getting a low carb diet and they're ingesting sugar of some sort. And that includes food, you know, like refined is what I'm talking about. Um, it doesn't do them any good because, you know, you've, when you're, as we all know, when you're fasting or um, it's particularly when you're fasting at least 14 hours, you're getting something called autophagy that happens at cellular house cleaning. And we're getting rid of all the gunk and the inflammation and the old cells, old dead cells and cells that aren't working so well. Um, all of that goes away. But if you're you're then you're re gunking it up again <laughs> with, you know, this uh, intake of poor food. So what are the thresholds for blood sugar uh, that causes glycation? Is this like a like a spectrum? Is it a binary uh, effect? I mean, I guess, you know, maybe another way to answer the question or ask the question is what uh, differences would complex carbohydrates that you talked about, like more like sweet potatoes versus mm -hmm. something that's like refined glucose, just pure sugar going into your system. Is this more of an effect of the speed in which glucose is delivered, which results in a very, very high, uh, I guess, time scale of having high blood sugar? Or is this something that is unique with glucose versus other forms of uh, polysaccharides or uh, other sugars? This is actually a really great question because it is about the slowdown and the release of the sugar. And, um, you know, it, because if you think about it over time, there's not such a, a load on the cells, right? Mm -hmm. But still, um, if, if it's refined sugar, if you would just take a little bit every, you know, <laughs> you know, hour or so, it still has that effect. It still has that glycation effect. And I would say, you know, those of us who keep our blood sugar relatively low, um, say, let's say uh, 80 below or below, we, we don't have much glycation going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're, we're doing pretty well um, in that department, I think. Um, but I don't know, I don't have any literature specifically that would go to that point, but that's a great you know, I'd love to find out. Because it would be interesting in the sense that end of the day, the carbohydrates break down into, the, into glucose and glucose is a valuable substrate for metabolism. We need some sort of sugar, whether that's exogenous sugars that we do eat through carbohydrates or we make our own through gluconeogenesis right. through protein or fat. Um, so there's going to be some glucose hanging around in our bodies no matter what, right? There like, always uh, is. There always yeah. is. So it sounds like there's some threshold effect or it might be a spectrum where with a, controlled blood sugar level, there's an acceptable level of glycation. But when you have these massive spikes and it overloads your glucose disposal, then you have this huge spike of glucose and you have this huge spike of glycation and that doesn't really get turned over. Also too, many people uh, are addicted to sugar. Okay. And they, it, they eat it in you know, and that includes, I throw in white flour with that <laughs> because you can't have sugar and white flour. They're, they typically go hand in hand. Yeah. When our fat cells have excess nutrition, which means excess fat and sugar, because our fat cells store these and more compounds, they become bloated, right? And these fat cells then act as if they're infected and they send out these inflammatory molecules and mm. they molecules such as macrophages and it creates a whole immune response remember the word immune that i used early on and this response is not just within the fat cell because it circulates throughout the body our fat cells are only about the size of a period on the end of a sentence when they're healthy but when they become bloated like this um, then they're sending out all these inflammatory molecules and you can imagine we have 100 billion of them what that kind of effect that could have if you're say obese yeah. and this really uh, is inflammatory in many many ways and of course we have to be careful of the sugar intake that's why i say avoid sugar because the people that i have you know have uh, i've 
my clients and readers, et cetera, that avoid sugar lose weight automatically. Yeah. Because the body just does not know what to do with excess sugar. Right. And that creates an insulin issue, et cetera. So my book, my last book, How to Fight Fat Flammation, actually you know, takes away the inflammation and the fat cell inflammation and uh, people lose weight and optimize their health. So I can see why that strategy works. Absolutely. One thing that I wanted to bring up and was this notion that you talked about uh, advanced glycation products causing mm -hmm. some sort of browning effect and that can we tease into that a little bit and and i want to make sure that's likely and distinct from brown adipose tissue versus white adipose tissue and i think that's been an interesting area of recent research the different types of adipose or fat tissues uh can we touch upon those two topics absolutely yeah so the browning effect occurs you know because uh it's kind of like when you, you know, you've seen the cr crispy brown potatoes on the stove yeah. or you've seen the fried chicken, the crispiness, right? That same process occurs in the human body when sugars and, and as I mentioned before, proteins connect, okay? So that's, uh, that's the advanced glycation end products, that's ages, and in, which is kind of a great term because it, it does cause inflammation, okay, which is uh, aging is a uh, inflammation is a theory of aging. Yeah. Um, it's one theory of aging. But the brown fat tissue is uh, a is brown, and we have very little of it in our body. We want more of it, but we have a little bit. We're born with it. Okay. And uh, then white fat tissue is that jiggly mass that we all feel, you know, on our stomach or our arms or the backs of our legs or something. And that's um, white adipose tissue. Right. And so uh, the brown adipose tissue or BAT for short is uh, where we're born with it, but we can make more of it. We can recruit more um, brown fat, if you will. And there are ways to do it. We can do it through exercise. High intensity interval training is fantastic, and when when we start recruiting the um, the the brown fat uh, from white fat, we then it's called beige fat. Okay, so um, we have uh, three different colors of fat, but ideally we want a mixture of both. So the white fat is really just a storage fat an energy depot, if you will. Um, we have triglycerides stored there and if and it keeps us warm and insulated. So the, um, and most of us have too much of it, okay? Um, the brown fat, however, again, we were born with it. It's usually around the clavicle, uh, the shoulders, a little bit down the back. Um, but that fat is very um energy dense because again it's it's packed with mitochondria and so when we um we're born with it um and then we again we can recruit it to encourage more brown fat and the problem is that um when we we gain weight we have excess fat tissue we don't have that opportunity to do that um, because the fat, there's an imbalance in energy within the fat cell. And so obviously that means inflammation, uh, oxidation is occurring and all sorts of fun things that are promoting this vicious cycle of, uh, weight gain. So, uh, we can promote brown fat and we can remove white fat if we want. I've just been reading a little bit of literature in that space where, as, as you mentioned, high intensity interval training is helpful for that. There's some interesting data, perhaps on cold ice plunge therapy type things could be interesting for converting white to brown fat. They've done research with temperatures, right? Yeah. So temperatures between 63 and 66 degrees, just a couple hours a day. Um, actually promotes more brown fat. Yeah. And there was this man, I was reading this article, and I, he lived in Seattle. And you know, Seattle in the winter is cold. Yeah. Um, but every night, he would sleep with his window open. And you know how cold it gets there at night. Yeah. And he you know, was like, uh, just as thin as a rail. Guy. <laughs> but very interesting, you know, N equals one experiment there, you know. He, so, yeah. um, yeah, and then berberine is a, is a nutrient that one can take to amplify AMPK and to, you know, shift from uh, to more brown fat in the body. Yeah. Going back to 
diet for a second here. So we talked about restricting carbohydrate and obviously in, in terms of nutrition, it's kind of zero sum. You have lower carbohydrate. Well, you got to get calories from either more protein or more fat. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the topics that I think is worth talking about and, and clarifying for people are, uh, I think in terms of protein, I think people have a decent sense that you need to have enough protein to maintain lean muscle tissue. But fat, I think, is like is is the one that could be confusing to people. Not all types of fat are necessarily the same. Uh, I think there's polyunsaturated fatty, you know, fats, seed oils versus saturated fats from animals or coconut oil or MCT oils. Um, curious in your experience, um, what types of fat that do you try and tend to gravitate towards um and then maybe piggybacking off of that have you been following some of the discussion around even going full into carnivore diets where you just completely remove vegetable <laughs> matter at all and just go completely heavily into saturated fats and all of that curious to get your sense of, of the world of fat it can't be overstated that vegetable oils or you know processed seed oils are uh to to be kicked to the curb okay those are so inflammatory and it just you know it it stuns me whenever i go into whole foods for example and they have all of their their most of their products are made with canola oil yeah and um but when you see these oils you know people think oh vegetable oil you know, it's vegetables. <laughs> yeah, it seems good. It seems healthy. Yeah. I, I, mean, I grew up thinking that too. A vegetable is in there, but you know, uh, so corn oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, cottonseed, safflower, peanut oil, all of those. Soybean oils, big soybean too. Soybean yeah. are just um, not healthy at all. So kick them to the curb. One thing that, again, people I think should really understand, which is why are these so highly inflammatory? Just as with refined sugar, it's a highly processed food, right? And the body on a, from a cellular perspective doesn't know what to do with it. So they, it just says, okay, either I'm going to burn it really quickly, or it's going to be stored somewhere in the body. And then it, it, because we should only be carrying a little bit of glucose anyway, it gets stored. Okay, as fat gets turned to fat, especially in the liver, and that's a whole nother situation. But there's something called arachidonic acid that is created when you have these um, these oils. And arachidonic acid can be good, but arachidonic acid also has it's like a good cop, bad cop, and um, it's inflammatory as well. So again, uh, the body is is floundering around trying to figure out what to do with processed foods. And that's why, uh, so there was a, a study that came out, uh, showing that, um, just four fast food meals a week raised your mortality risk for 60 by 64%. So that's, that's just four, you know, a week. And how many people eat fast food every day, yeah. you know, on the way to work, on the way home to get dinner, um, at lunchtime, it's just, uh, terrible. So, you know, a lot of these processed foods, they have inflammatory oils in them yeah. as well, because they're all cheap oils. Yep. And, uh, food manufacturers know that they're cheap. And so that's why they use them. Yeah. And one thing to piggyback of it off your thoughts, there is that, you know, we've all seen a soybean, we've all seen corn, like where's the oil in that vegetable right and it's like you you can't like squeeze out and i think just from that very simple elementary school level the oil that you see that's like very pure like uh, and and, and, in uniform and very cheap how how do you get that from like something that you can't really even taste the oil from so i think that goes back to the highly processed nature of how you talk about these oils and that's something that i've been very you know personally focused on as well just reducing the amount of seed oils that i consume and it's very very hard because so much that's the de facto oil that's used now. I know it's really terrible. Yeah. And, and many people think it's, you know, oh, I had this, this, and this, or they're cooking on YouTube and they're using their canola oil. And I'm going, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined your meal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, pufas so, or seed oils, let's try to avoid those. We want monounsaturated fats. Yeah. So, we want avocado oils. We want um, coconut oil, is fantastic, even though it's high in saturated fat. It is very good for you. It's yeah. an anti-inflammatory oil. Macadamia nut oil is fantastic. Um, olive oil, of course, is, is excellent. Just don't heat it up too high. Yeah. Um, so those are my go-tos. 
And how about animal fat? I mean, uh, going to go, go into more on the carnivore side. Have you looked at that? I mean, you think it's crazy. You think it's interesting. Curious to get your thoughts there. When I first heard a carnivore, I went, what? <laughs> you know, I was yeah. totally not on board with it. Yeah. Um, but, but I do. Okay. So I do have a feeling that, um, that it, the people are missing out somewhere if they're not eating the right types of meat then they're going to be missing out on some really important nutrients. So I think it's if they're doing carnivore or mostly meat, they need to really either take a lot of nutrients, you know, or uh, make sure their meat is, is really quality meat. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I've had a couple people on my podcast uh, that are carnivore and they had me changing my mind a little bit about yeah. it because for one, I know for a fact that they're giving their bodies a rest no matter what. So if, if lectin with plants and other toxins with plants are an issue for many people, then, you know, this is going to allow them to heal their gut, you know, maybe just a month. Right. And then they can get back on the, um, the plant train again. But I think that it's, it's really beneficial for people who are suffering from gut distress. Yeah. I really do. Um, but yes, I believe in animal fat. I think, you know, animal protein is fantastic. Um, I, you know, I'm not a fan of uh, the vegetarian diet because I feel like they're missing out on a really important component uh, in terms of optimizing their health. And that's protein. Yeah. B12 and you know I agree with you there as well I, I think there's a moral and ethical argument of not eating mammals and I think that's very commendable and I personally right. I understand and empathize with that point of view but I think when you talk about health of you as an individual clearly there's a lot of value in the nutrient density of animal protein and animal meat and animal organs. I mean, I think that's just pretty right. consistent through literature and as well as in, in all the data there. So I had, um, Dr. Garth Davis yeah. and he's the author of proteinaholic on my show. And he, uh, is made plant based all the way. And he and I would go back and forth on Twitter about, you know, this and that, and yeah. he'd always jump on me if I brought up, uh, you know, plant, uh, meat. Right. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting because everybody has their research that they can pull out. Right. But it, from, to me, from, like you said, from, you know, a historical perspective, we can see the differences in health and you, you can see the people, the, the, uh, studies that show people that go back on a meat diet, what happens to them, their health changes for the better. Yeah. Yeah, so curious as they're zooming back into sort of modern discussion or, or, or today, um, what else do you think are some of the most cutting edge or interesting or most controversial discussions in nutrition? I think we touched on carnivore, I think, as like a kind of a recent trendy concept. I would say keto and low carb, I think, really started picking up in the last maybe five years, fasting. Um, anything in your networks and as you're talking to other experts and all of that, like, what do you think is interesting that kind of sparked your, your interest recently? The notion of our gut being the epicenter of every aspect in our body. It touches every organ in our body. And it's not as um, sexy as the carnivore diet, of course, but, you know, it's been around at least, you know, in terms of in the public eye for about 10 years, but it is, um, it is, you know, I just got back from the World uh, Microbiome Conference, mm -hmm. and it was unbelievable. So they were talking about, you know, the the short chain fatty acids that we get from, um, you know, from eating fiber, right, yeah. from vegetables, etc. And I started thinking about all the people that are missing out, like on the carnivore diet. And yet, if they're taking ketones, though, that's a whole different, you know, they can make up for that. The right. BHP. Beta, yeah, BHP can yeah. be a fuel for gut microbiome as well. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And that, um, that, you know, there's new information in the area of bacteria and, you know, the, the, the hygiene, the health hygiene theory where we're all just way too clean, you know? Mm. So they have recently found uh, mycobacterium. There's a fat in a bacteria, okay? 
that has been shown to take away depressive symptoms. And this, of course, I'm sure you're aware that depression is an inflammatory issue as well. Mm. They don't know really whether inflammation comes first or depression is followed, follow suit or vice versa, right? Chicken or the egg. Um, but nonetheless, this is really interesting in terms of um, what's on the horizon. So fat bacteria. <laughs> Okay. Interesting. And I also agree with you on the gut microbiome. I think uh, there's more and more literature and research in the area. Uh, but I think from a intervention perspective, it sounds like there's, there's a little bit potentially early in terms of saying, oh, you want this strain or that strain. I think it's still a little bit early for that, but absolutely a very fascinating area of research. Yeah. In fact, there are multiple researchers and they were all presenting their latest research on the gut microbiome, microbiome. And they actually said, you know, hold off on those probiotic supplements because, you know, some could be worsening your condition because we don't really know what all those strains are doing, yeah. right? You know, we, we have, you know, lactobacillus might be good for most people, but other than that, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. So as yeah. we wrap up here, I always like to ask this question to my guests. And um, if you had infinite resources to run a study and you, had in, you can recruit infinite types of people, whether they're tall, short, blue, green, they're diabetic or they're completely healthy, what study would you run and what questions would you want answered? I would love to see how uh, the, the different foods affect people's microbiome. I think I would love to see that research more. We, we're in the process of doing it now, but I would love to see if I had all the money in the world, I could answer that question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I think that data would spark a lot of interesting companies and products and all of that and also right. just change people's <laughs> lives so i think that's actually a really practical <laughs> a very practical study awesome laurie no thanks so much for taking the time to share your insights into inflammation yeah. and, and different uh, health practices so i know you're on twitter where do our listeners find you what are the projects you're working on for the rest of the year how do people follow along Yes, you can find me on Twitter, Lori Shemek, on Facebook, Dr. Lori Shemek. Uh, you can find me on Instagram as Lori Shemek. And I have two books on Amazon, How to Fight Fat Formation and Fire Up Your Fat Burn. And um, I have a book coming out, um, The Ketogenic Key, at the end of the summer. And um, I am working on a huge program for people to really optimize their health, reduce inflammation create better habits, everything one needs to optimize their life. Awesome. So we'll have to stay tuned and catch you as the book is released and all of that. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. If you want to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit www.hvmn.com slash pod. Also, by writing a review on our iTunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com, we'll hook you up with $15 worth of HVMN store credit. Our last shout out goes out to our listener survey, which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes you find most valuable. Visit go.hvmn.com slash podcast survey for that survey. It'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. Until next time, eat well, train smart, and live your life.